Good afternoon, everyone. Well, um, my name is Alan Gates, and I am one of the founders of Hortonworks. And I, whoa, and I'm loud. Um, and I have been involved with uh, projects around Hadoop for about seven years now. I work on Pig, on Hive on whatever else in kind of the language and metadata space that needs, uh, needs worked on. Uh, and I will be talking today about a lot of the work we've done lately in Hive to make it suitable for analytics. So when Hive started, it was definitely batch oriented. It was built around um, really ETL type operations, not a lot of interactive query type stuff, not connecting it to BI tools. Over the last year, a ton of work has gone into the Hive um, project to change that, and so I want to kind of summarize that, talk about it, show you some of the things that have changed and some of the work that's going on, that's continuing to go on now. So, whoops, that was my title slide there. So, just as a uh, kind of summary, what did we set out to do here? So. As I said, Hive started in the batch world where it handled big and scale. It handled terabytes of data. That was good. It was built on top of Hadoop and MapReduce, and that's what Hadoop does well. So scale it had down. But as I said, it didn't have a lot of speed. It also didn't have a lot of the SQL that people would want, right? So if you're, um, if you come to Hive and Hadoop from, say, Oracle or Teradata or SQL Server or something like that, you come to Hive SQL, all of a sudden it looks like, you know, very, very limited SQL. Very, a lot of the things you want missing. So about 18 months ago in the Hive project, a number of contributors, uh, Hortonworks, Microsoft, uh, some other Facebook, and some others that were heavy users of Hive got together and started doing a lot of work to change that. And this got codenamed the Stinger Initiative because that was, you know, uh, somebody thought that was a cool name. The engineers originally just called it Hive Plus Plus or something, and then the marketing people said, you can't call it that, that's boring. So you, you gotta have a cool code name. So there's our, you know, putting the Sting in Hive became the cool code name. Um, and so this really did have three goals. As I said, one is to make this fast, make it interactive. Now, I want to be very clear here when I say what we mean by fast. This is something that it's reasonable for a human to sit at the terminal and use. Or if you're, say, using Tableau or MicroStrategies or something like that to do, um, you know, to graph out the results of your queries to build reports, you want this to be an interactive experience. When, um, before we started this, that was not the case with Hive. It was definitely, you know, start a query go get a cup of coffee or whatever. We want this to be something you can sit and work with, but we're not aiming at the real-time space here. So when I say real-time, I think of you know, stock tickers or those kind of stuff, sub-second type responses where it's machine-to-machine -machine communications. That's not what we're, we're aiming at here, but we are uh, aiming at an analyst being able to sit there and use this in an interactive way. Um, as I said from the beginning, Hive had scale because it worked on Hadoop. But often, as you build these systems, you have to make trade-offs, speed versus um, scale. And we didn't want to make that trade-off that, OK, now it's much faster, but it's, uh, suddenly it doesn't scale anymore. Right? We want queries that work over 10 terabytes or 100 terabytes or whatever. And that, that you know, we want to preserve that piece of Hive. And then finally, we want, um, we want SQL that analysts and tools are going to expect. I, I get asked a lot, when is Hive going to be fully SQL 92 compliant or SQL 2003 or whatever? We don't sit and worry about that. We don't actually care whether it meets everything in a given standard. What we care about is two things, that it does everything people want it to do and that it does it in a standard compliant way. So we're going to go out and add the features that we believe um, and that we hear from users that they need to do their jobs. And I'll walk through many examples of what that is. But um, you know, when you're doing analytics with SQL, you want things like windowing functions. You want um, subqueries. You want a number of things that Hive didn't have. And so we set out to add that. All right. So 
let's, um, let me start with just a little bit of background here. I'm not going to go super in-depth on this, but I want to just lay a little groundwork. Um, in Hadoop 1, there was MapReduce. That was the only execution paradigm you had. Um, Hadoop 2, with the introduction of Yarn, suddenly we're freed from MapReduce as the only way to do things. Now, if you set out to design a parallel database system like Hive, you would not design MapReduce underneath naturally as the first or best way to do this. It just wouldn't be your first choice. Uh, Pig and Hive and others used this in uh, Hadoop 1 because that was the only option, right? With Hadoop 2, we can now start to build things like Tez um, that are what we would want. And we can take Tez and evolve that from MapReduce to keep all that learning of how do you handle scale, how do you uh, deal with reliability in the face of uh, failable, you know, hardware that's likely to fail, all those kinds of things that are already known in MapReduce, we can put that into Tez, but we can make it better. So um, the idea behind Tez is let's not think about just map and reduce, let's generalize this to a DAG execution engine where we can build the operators we want. Um, let's think about a task and give it inputs and outputs, and then ways we can tie tasks together instead of just thinking about it in map and reduce. And let me give you an example of exactly of what this might look like. So up here on the top, we have a admittedly rather synthetic SQL query that was chosen because it works well with these pictures. Um, but it is a realistic query, right? It's really, you know, this is valid SQL. Um, on the left here, we have what this would look like in the old MapReduce world, where that breaks down into four MapReduce jobs. And there's a number of things you, know, you can notice as you look at this picture that, that don't look good. So one is, you never ever need these map tasks down here. Anything you can do in subsequent map tasks, you can always push into preceding reduces, always. So you're spawn, spawning these tasks that do no work or that aren't necessary. Um, the other thing is you're writing intermediate results to HDFS because in the old Hadoop 1 world, that's the only option. That's all you can do. And uh, HDFS is great for reliability, but it wasn't built for quickly moving data between tasks. Uh, and not only is this not the fastest write in the world, it's a synchronization barrier. I can't start these tasks until these are completely finished. There's no ability to optimize that or, or blend those tasks. And finally, the scheduler in the Hadoop 1 world has no idea that these four jobs are related. These are just four MapReduce jobs that it happens to be working on. It may choose to run these first two, and then it might wait 10 minutes before it runs this next one because it's busy doing other stuff. Right? It, it has no notion that these are interrelated and that it should work with them as a whole set. On the other hand, we see what this would look like in the Tez world, where now you can construct jobs that are a series of tasks, maps and reduces, and you can feed data directly from one reduce to another. And to be clear, you can do more than map and reduce in Tez. This uh, doesn't demonstrate that, but it there are other types of tasks you can have. This is just to demonstrate that I'm no longer forced through map reduce, map reduce, right? I can move from map to reduce. I can choose, whoop, I can run my slides correctly. I can choose what kind of edges I want here, how I want to move data. In the old um, Hadoop 1 world, all data was moved by um, shuffle through, you write to local disk and then the reducer pulls it. And then as I said here, between jobs you store in HDFS. Depending on job size, you might want to make different choices about how to move data between these tasks. Um, if your job is very fast, say your optimizer estimates it's going to take you five seconds to run this entire query, you might as well move this data in memory. Because if you blow up down here and you have to rerun the whole thing because you, don't, you didn't keep around the intermediate results, who cares? It's five seconds, right? On the other hand, if you estimate this job is going to run for five hours, you certainly want to keep around intermediate results, probably in a fairly persistent store like HDFS, 
um, so that if you do explode at the bottom, you're only, you've only got 30 minutes of rerun to do instead of five hours, right? But you want the optimizer of your tool, like Hive, to make that choice for you, rather than forcing you in this old model, you know, with a rigidity of it's always done here and it's always done this way. So those are the goals behind Tez. If, um, if you want to get way more details about Tez, which I encourage you to, because there's a lot of interesting work, there's a couple talks uh, that will be covering it here in the conference. Uh, immediately after this talk, but I believe in a different room, there's a talk where, uh, that will go through the details of exactly how Tez speeds up one particular Hive query, kind of a deep dive on exactly th uh, how it works and what it does. And tomorrow, um, there's a talk on more Tez in general, all its internals, how it works, all that kind of stuff. All right. Um, one other thing briefly that Tez gives us besides this is it, or besides the uh, DAG operations, is it gives us the ability to have sessions up and standing so we don't have to spend all our time starting up jobs, right? One of the issues in MapReduce 1 is startup time for a typical MapReduce job was 15 to 20 seconds. MapReduce was originally designed to work on jobs that were going to run for hours, so nobody cared that something took 15 to 20 seconds to start. But when you say, I want to do interactive query, I want query results to come back in two to five seconds, and you have a 15-second startup time, you've got a problem, right? So Tez also solves that for us. All right. So um, let's talk a little bit about numbers. We tend to use the TPCDS uh, benchmark to do a lot of our benchmarking on things to figure out how fast we're going. This is a... D uh, DS stands for decision support, so it's kind of data warehousing type queries. That's why we chose it. It's got a very nice spread of different, different types of queries. And you see here in the blue, Hive 12. And in the red, uh, this is a proto Hive 13. Uh, as I'll cover more later, Hive 13 hasn't been released yet, but it's very close. And this is Hive 13 with all the optimizations turned on. And so, this, and this is over a scale 200, so that means uh, 200 gigabytes. Obviously very small. We're not um, trying to test the scalability here in terms of size. We're trying to test, can we run well when the data set is small? Can we be fast when it's clear that it's not scan time that's our limiting factor? And so you see here we have, um, you know, queries, whoops, where's my pointer, ranging anywhere from this one is five seconds, I think, um, to, depending on the complexity of the query, sometimes still fairly long. But we've got a number of queries down here that are now running in the, in the few seconds range. So can we still do it at scale? Um, this is some of the t uh, same queries from TPCS, TPCDS run at uh, 10 terabyte scale. And I think all these, except, whoop, except maybe this one, finish in under a minute. So we're still, um, we're still going fairly quickly there. Now, to be uh, clear, that doesn't mean that all those are scanning 10 terabytes. That means the base tables they're working on are that size. They're picking some, part, some portion of that, and they're using the, um, the optimizer to figure out which pieces and not scan the whole table. And I want to be clear that our optimizer isn't 100% brilliant at that yet, and some of these queries we had to rewrite to help it figure out exactly how to do that. So I just want to be upfront with that. We're not saying if you just run TPCDS as is, you'll get these results. There was a little bit of massaging going on there, which hopefully in a release or so we'll solve. So these, these numbers are getting down in the range where we feel a lot better about, okay, this is something people can use speed-wise. So now let's talk a little bit about um, some of the other stuff, some of the SQL side of it. What kind of work have we been doing to make it more usable? Um, so Hive 10, and well, let's start with Hive 10 as a base, because that's a good, a good place to start with. In Hive 10, it had the SQL supported select, join, where, group by, Really basic stuff, right? Really, it was, it was aimed around ETL. That's what people were mostly using it for. 
so that was fine. In Hive 11, as a first step, we added uh, the windowing functions, rank, row number, over clause, that kind of stuff. That work was done by SAP and contributed to Hive. And, but now in Hive 13, uh, we've really stepped up the, the pace at which we're adding these kinds of features. So in, before Hive could do subqueries in the from clause, but that's, and that's useful, but people also want to be able to do them in the where and having clause. So that's been added. Um, just to be clear there, we, there are, we can do most subqueries in the from, or in the, sorry, in the where clause. If we can't figure out how to rewrite it out of a correlated subquery, then we'll actually throw an error and say, sorry, we can't figure out how to do that. Because doing a correlated subquery, a truly correlated subquery over a distributed system like Hadoop is hard and we, we don't have that working just yet. Um, so common table expressions have been added, which is the with clause. Uh, old style join conditions, this is not exciting. I don't think anybody goes, yay, I can write my joins in the where clause instead of in the from clause, but tools like uh, uh, Tableau and MicroStrategies go yay, because that's how they write it, right? So basically, that's about making this connect better to your tool set. And um, finally, we've added permanent functions. In the past, Hive obviously supports user-defined functions, but you had to bring the jar yourself every time. You had to register the function as part of your query. There was no ability to store those, no ability to share them between users inside Hive. Um, now with 13, you can, an administrator can create a function, load that jar into HDFS, and then users can use that, uh, can share that function, which is actually very nice. That means now you can have one standard version across your organization of a given function instead of worrying about, oh, am I using the same, you know, does this function mean the same thing to me that it means to you, or where did you store that jar for it, all that kind of stuff. Um, security. So obviously, as Hive gets more and more use, people are more and more concerned about how do I share this across the organization in a secure way? How do I open this up to all the people I want to use it without um, letting them see the data they shouldn't see, right? You may have lots of analysts, lots of people that need to see your data, but you may not want to open the financial data ever to everybody because that has implications about um, what kind of controls you have to have on those people, whether they can trade in your stock, all kinds of things that you may or may not want to deal with. Um, so in Hive 12 and before, there were two types of security, in, or there were two security options in Hive. One was called the storage-based authorization provider. This is where Hive would look at how the data, what the security measures were for the data on HDFS and apply the same thing to the metadata. So if you had permission to read the file, you would be given permission to select from the table. If you had permission to write to the file, you'd be per given permission to insert into the table, to drop the table, all those kinds of things. This has the advantage that it works, because HDFS is security works, but it's very coarse-grained. I can't do column-level security. Um, there's no way to secure views in this, because a view doesn't map to a file uh, directly. And then there was the default option, which was completely advisory. It didn't really mean anything, you could say grant, you know, grant Allen the rights to read this table, but who had the rights to run grant was not controlled, so if, if you hadn't granted me rights to your table and I wanted to read it, I could simply grant myself rights to your table. That's not security, that's, um, I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and I mean, in fairness, it was built you know, in the early days of Hive just to give people, you know, kind of safety bumpers so they didn't totally uh, wreck their system without meaning to. But that's, you know, Hive's at a place now where that kind of thing doesn't work. So in Hive 13, we have added uh, SQL standard security, where with grant and revoke, with roles, all the things that you expect out of SQL security, um, the since that also applies to views, you can now do row and column level security. So you can say, I have this base table, maybe nobody but me or you know, the group that creates this data can see that base table, but I can create views on this that allow people to, you know, people in the marketing department can see 
the marketing appropriate pieces, people in the finance department can see the finance uh, appropriate pieces, that kind of stuff. Now, I want to be clear here, one limitation on this is for this to work properly, those people can't have access to the underlying data on HDFS, because if they do, obviously they can circumvent this. You can, Hive stores its data in HDFS, it's not at all hard to figure out which files uh, are associated with which tables or partitions, and so if you lock these people out and say you can't read my table, but underneath they can get in and read in the HDFS, well, you haven't, done, you haven't accomplished anything yet. Oh, sorry, the, are the users, uh, we depend on Hadoop to tell us who a user is. So um, a user and Hadoop depends on either the OS or LDAP or whatever you configure it to, right? So we wanted to stay within the Hadoop ecosystem here where we don't create our own users, but we use the users given to us. Roles, on the other hand, we do create. So you can say create role, um, you know, development or marketing or whatever and then assign users into that role. Uh, we do not, at the moment, associate groups like LDAP groups or Unix groups to roles. We've discussed doing that. Um, we, it just didn't get done in the first pass. Um, and then we want to take this in the future and extend it to cover um, functions, right? So I mentioned that now in Hive 13 you can create a function, but we don't yet have control over who can execute those functions. So you would like to be able to do that. You'd like to be able to grant execute to functions on people or revoke it from people. Um, and so that's a kind of plan to future. Um, all right, this is one of those places where it's about conforming to tools. I don't know that people get super excited about, yay, we support new data types. Maybe you do, I don't know. But um, the point here is we want to make this easy to integrate with the, uh, the data tools you already have. One of the issues Hive had is that it really had not a SQL type model, but a Java type model, right? When you look at Hive 10 and before, it, the types were string, int, float. That sounds like Java. And that's great for us developers who think in Java all day, but it's not great for people who are SQL users but not Java programmers, and it's really bad for the rest of the tool chain, right? When you go to connect a relational database to Hive and tell it, I want to pull this data out of Hive and put it in the relational database, and the first question the database asks is, how long is that string field? Because it's going to turn it into a var car or a car. And Hive says, I don't know, it's a string. You know, that's, now you're stuck, right? So we need to conform Hive's type model to what's standard for SQL, obviously without breaking the existing one. There's lots and lots of people out there using Hive. We can't break it for them. So in Hive 11, we had a decimal uh, for, uh, so that you could do uh, precise calculations, not, uh, you know, not floating point. Uh, in Hive 12, we added date and varcar types. And then in 13, car has been added and user-defined precision and scale for decimal. So with this, we've covered most of the commonly used data types for a lot of the, uh, the a lot of other data systems use. All right. Um, this is one that I like to talk about because I'm actually, this is what I'm working on at the moment. And if you're interested in more, there's an, a talk tomorrow to go into deeper detail on what we're doing here. But one of the things that people obviously do with data bases is beyond just read data from them, they actually write data to them. And new data, not or little bits of data, not necessarily in chunks at a time. Hive came from the batch world where you create a par uh, partition at a time, usually because it's coming off of your log somewhere, you're storing a whole new partition, that's fine. But there's some limitations to that. Sometimes you want to update some of that data. Sometimes maybe you have a dimension table. You need to add a new row, say that dimension table stores all the physical uh, stores that your company owns. You open a new store in a new town, you'd like to add the row to that table, obviously, or maybe that store moves across the street, you need to change the address, all those kinds of things. Those weren't easy to do in Hive in the past. And 
Um, the other big one is it wasn't easy to stream data into Hive. Uh, streaming tools like Flume or Storm can generate data hundreds of rows a second. And they can record that, they can write that to HDFS very quickly. That all works fine. But because of Hive's partition based nature, you couldn't really add a partition more than once every 15 minutes or once every hour. Otherwise, you'd overwhelm the Metastore with hundreds of thousands of partitions and everything would grind to a halt. Um, so with the work we're doing now, we want to change that, right? We want to enable updates and deletes, not, not constant updates and deletes. We're not going for OLTP here. That wouldn't work with what we're doing. But we want to enable data correction. We want to enable uh, streaming data in from these tools like Flume and Storm and, being, and enable you to read, the, read that data instantly as soon as it comes in. And so in Hive 13, we're uh, doing the first drop of this, which is the, in, the streaming ingest work. And we've, uh, we have uh, done the integration with Flume. The Storm integration hasn't been done yet. Um, and then in Hive 14, we plan to extend this into the SQL language itself so that you can do like an insert of values uh, type, you know, where you say insert these five values into my table, where you can update a table or delete a table, and then and have regular transactions. So you can say begin transaction, do a bunch of queries, commit, all done with standard ACID, consistency, isolation, all those kinds of things. So again, if you want more details, uh, Owen and I will be talking about that in depth tomorrow. All right, um, kind of moving back to the performance side a little bit. The, when Hive started, its optimizer was very rule-based. It was things like always push a filter in front of a join, those kinds of simple things. Uh, well, I, I don't, by saying simple, I don't mean to imply they're not important, they are important. But those kinds of things that are, are very binary. You either want to do it or you don't. You always want to make this choice. As Hive gets more complex, that's, um, that's not going to work anymore, right? As you're doing these big data warehousing queries where you've got a fact table and five dimension tables, which is a very common thing to want to do, the order in which you choose to join those is crucial to the performance of your query. Um, it can be literally the difference between seconds and hours, depending on the choices you make. And there's no rule that can tell you that. You can't a priori know, I should do this one before that one. You have to look at the statistics and you have to make some kind of estimation of what's going to be the best way to do this. So um, in, uh, so work going on now, and this is not going to be in Hive 13, I just want to be clear, um, is to integrate Hive with Optic, which is a optimizer generator. You can kind of think of Optic as, Optic is to optimizers as Antler is to parsers. So it's the, it gives you the ability to generate an optimizer for your system. It's optics being used in a number of different projects um, around Hadoop, plus some stuff outside of the Hadoop world. Um, but we were very happy when last fall, uh, Julian Hyde, who is the main driver for Optic, joined us at Hortonworks, excuse me, and is now working with us to integrate it with Hive. And so, um, the first step there is just choosing the right join ordering, as I said. Um, that will actually be in the upcoming HDP release. H yeah, but it won't be in Apache yet. It'll be posted to Apache, but we just haven't gotten it. We're, we were too far behind the curve to get it in Apache 13, unfortunately, so it won't be in there. Um, but it'll be in the next, in uh, uh, Hive 14. And then um, from there, there's a lot of work to do to expand, to get better statistics, to integrate ordering, join ordering decisions with uh, join implementation choice decisions. Am I going to do this as a hash join? Am I going to do it as a sort join? All those kinds of questions. Um, so still a lot of work to do there, but a very exciting beginning on, on building a true cost-based optimizer into Hive. All right. Um, part of making Hive faster is optimizing the way it stores data. So if you look at any data warehouse type uh, solution, they have very highly specialized ways they store data. There's been a lot of work going on in the Hadoop community on optimizing these file formats. 
ORC is a fi uh, file format built inside Hive that's optimized around columnar storage and fast access to the data. Um, just to be clear, ORC stands for Optimized RC File. I'm not sure it's the best you know, acronym or name we ever came up with, but whatever. Um, it's what? <laughs> it's memorable, that is true. It's easy to remember. Actually, my favorite thing is that Facebook took this, did some work on it, cloned it for some internal things they were doing and called theirs Dwarf, which I thought was, <laughs> thought was really fun. But um, anyway, so uh, the important things about ORC are it's built for columnar access, so in most data warehousing type queries, you're not looking at the whole row. You're usually looking at pieces of it. So ORC is highly optimized around columnar access. It's, um, it's built knowing Hive's data types. So all the other formats out there that have traditionally been used with Hive, even ones inside Hive, like our C file, are data type agnostic. But knowing the data type actually gives you all kinds of compression and um, performance potential, um, optimization potential. There's all kinds of things you can do when you know, oh, this is an integer versus this is a string. And so uh, ORC takes advantage of that by doing things like um, all strings in ORC are st stored in a dictionary. Um, so for each section of the file, each stripe, what ORC calls a stripe, you, um, you have a dictionary, and then the, the column entries become just a series of offsets into that dictionary, which is actually you know, is much more efficient than storing the string multiple times. It's even more efficient than compressing it with most standard compression stuff. And uh, integers can be stored in run length encoding. This works very well for a lot of integers, especially if you have um, fairly low cardinality columns or if you have columns that are um, where you're sorting along that, so you have a nice uh, compaction of those similar types. And then on top of that, you can still do standard gzip, zlib, whatever type of compression you want to choose. And um, ORC also has built-in indexes, and this is key for a lot of the planning that we're doing. Now, I referenced um, the optimizer starting to make use of statistics in Hive. This is part of where it's getting those statistics. This also enables us to answer certain types of queries. ORC stores in every uh, stripe what's the min, max, um, and count of records in this stripe. So if I'm doing those types of queries, I don't even have to read the entire stripe. I can just read the statistics and move on, which is much quicker. And I can use this to do um, stripe elimination if I have a filter, right? So say I'm doing a query where I only want to know about users who live in the Netherlands. I can look inside that index and say, nobody in this block lives in the Netherlands and throw the entire block away. And that, that's actually already being done in ORC today. So those kinds of features are very important for a lot of the performance we're building in Hive. Um, to give you a little idea of uh, kind of tightness of compression, there's, um, you know, over here on the, on the left here, you start out with, data in text, data in RC file, and then you finally down here in ORC, you come out with it, it uh, quite a bit smaller. All right, so what did we add in Hive 13 for ORC? We, uh, I t input split elimination, I talked about the vectorized reader I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we integrated this with PIG so that it's much easier to use this. If you use both PIG and Hive, you can use it together with ORC, and then, um, the ACID support that I talked about right now depends on ORC. We didn't actually write it to depend on ORC. Any, any storage format that uh, has a row ID can be used, so it's easy enough to extend, but we just did the ORC integration first. All right, um, continuing on performance, another thing that we did was rewrite a lot of the operators inside Hive to be much faster. So Hive was originally written as most databases are at first to do things one row at a time. That's not super efficient when you're doing data warehousing queries. It actually turns out to be much more efficient to do, to operate on blocks of 1,000 or 10,000 rows at a time. And you size that block so that it fits in your L1 cache, 
right? Because a miss, a cache miss, costs you something like 100 CPU cycles. So if you size that block so that it fits in your cache, and then you write your um, code such that you have very few branches inside that inside your inner loop, or if you do have branches, they're branches that will be very consistent about which direction they choose so that you can avoid stalling your pipeline on branch uh, mispredictions, you get incredible speed ups in how fast you can process stuff. So when we started this, we saw um, 30x improvements in how fast we were able to process rows in, an oper uh, in a given operator. Uh, this is a place where the open source nature of Hadoop has really paid off. We started working on this. The Microsoft guys said, hey, we really want to be a part of this. And they um, poured tons and tons of resources into this, collaborated with us on it, and, and hence we've been able to uh, build this feature in about uh, six to nine months, whereas if it had been you know, just one company working on it, it would have been quite a bit longer. All right, um, and finally, the ORC reader stuff and vectorization has been optimized to work with, a lot, with new stuff that's been going on in HDFS to be able to pin uh, files or sections of files in memory and then do a zero copy read so that if you have uh, tables that are being accessed very frequently, you can pin those in memory and you're not, you don't have to hit the disk at all to do these reads. All right, so... Um, there's a, where can you get it all this wonderful stuff, you ask? Um, you can download and play with uh, HTTP 2.1. There's uh, pre-release versions available now uh, at our website. Apache Hive 13 is, I, I put up here, at or near release candidate. I was hoping we'd actually have a release candidate by the time I did this talk and I could include the link to it, but uh, that didn't happen. So um, hopefully by the end of this week there'll be a release candidate. Uh, that you can download and play with. All right, and with that, let me open it up to questions. Is there a benchmark or a use case for defined indexing? Is there a use uh, support for defined indexing? You can define an index in Hive, but the optimizer doesn't take advantage of it yet. So it's not integrated with the optimizer to do it. Most of the indexing work we've been doing lately has been in the storage formats like ORC to do it uh, automatically. We haven't done a lot of work yet to enable the user to tune the indexes. So the question is, do we want to support theta joins or joins, non-equa non joins? Um, we don't have any immediate plans to do that because we haven't gotten a ton of feedback that that's important to people. If people start saying, hey, I really, really want to be able to do this, then we'll take a harder look at it. There's no opposition to it. We just haven't gotten tons of requests for it. So not the tons of requests just because people can find more graphs, but more people can understand the Hadoop, more, say, not sure. to, 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 to move forward, right? So, yeah, I, I totally agree. My only argument is it's, it's a fruit further up the tree. <laughs> Yes. Mm-hmm. Sure. Okay, so I'm going to summarize that as, is Windows behind Linux, and have there been a lot of changes in the windowing function behavior in the last few releases? Okay, HD Insight and Windows. So um, I'll half answer that. So HD Insights is a Microsoft product, and I don't control or actually even know about their release cycle, so I don't know for certain when their next release is or where they're at. I do know they just did a release with the 2.0, with what we call HTTP 2.0. I don't know when their plan is to pick up the 2.1 stuff. But I do know with HTTP 2.1, we will actually be doing, for the first time, simultaneous Windows and Linux releases. And they'll actually be the same bits. So in the past, 
we were uh, always a few weeks behind or a few months the first few times. On Windows releases, that won't be the case anymore. Um, as far as windowing functions changes, other than a s there were some small bug ch fixes in 13 for them, but I don't think we made any major changes to them. Yes? Um, okay, so the question is, will you be able to try Hive 13 on a Cloudera cluster? Strangely enough, Cloudera doesn't share their release plans with me, so, or their development plans, so I don't know if, uh, you can download it from Apache or from us, and you can run it on there. Um, will it be compatible with their version of Yarn? That's the one question I have, because I know that um, Tez, which Hive 13 uses, is depends on the very latest version of Yarn, and so I don't know where they're at on their versioning of that, whether they have those, uh, whether... They have two, they're at 2.3 plus a few, okay. So I think the latest version of Tez requires 2.4. So you might have to play around a bit. But you can make Hive 13 run without Tez, just MapReduce, that should work on any Hadoop 2 cluster um, just fine. Yes? Um, no, it te so the question is, is Tez the default engine? And the answer is no. It will still default to MapReduce unless you tell it to do Tez. You have to set that up in the configuration. Um, yeah, we wouldn't, we do believe it's stable. We wouldn't GA it if we didn't think it was stable. Yes? So question is, what are our plans for Optic? Yeah, we definitely plan to continue supporting Optic. Um, we want to see it be the default um, optimizer tool for all these kinds of projects. I mean, it's already got, got a lot of uptake, drills using it, uh, cascading uses it for lingual. There's a lot of other people looking at it, so we want to encourage that, and um, you know, Julian's full-time on, on that kind of work. Hold on, there was a question back here, and then I'll come up here. Yeah. Is there any reason you'd want to run MapReduce rather than Tez? Yeah, there might be a bug we haven't found yet. <laughs> but in, yeah, realistically, that's it, right? Our vision is that someday MapReduce falls out. It's just there now because Tez is new software, and I'm sure there will be, you know, I'm 100% certain we will find cases where it doesn't work or doesn't work optimally. Yes? So will there ever be a Hive 1.0? Um, that's, uh, in my mind, 1.0 is kind of, was about Hive 9 or something realistically, right? That's kind of a community decision of when do they want to call it that. Um, I don't know what the community's waiting for. I advocated to call it 1.0 a long time ago and it, honestly now I think we should just drop the leading zero and call it Hive 14 and move on, but, or Hive 13 and move on, but we'll see. Um, do we have any plans to integrate with Spark? Do we have any? Sure, sure. Essentially. So do we have any plan to integrate with Spark? Uh, no, not now. Um, that's, I mean, we built Tez because we thought it was the right thing to do relational stuff, right? Our view is that Spark is great at machine learning. It's great when you fit in memory, but it's not so great when you don't fit in memory. Right. Shark is, well, I wouldn't call it the equivalent. Shark is Hive ni uh, 0.9 with um, Spark as a back end. Yes? Uh huh. Our index is a big thing that are missing. Um, so you gotta keep in mind the kind of workload we're looking at here, right? This is mostly data warehousing stuff, not uh, OLTP stuff. So indexes are still important, but slightly less important. Um, that said, will we someday have it? Yeah, but we want it to be driven by realizing that that's actually the next biggest opportunity, 
rather than, oh, we don't have this, right? We never sit around and go, what do we not have that the databases have? We sit around and say, what, are, what is keeping us from being fastest or faster than we are today? And right now, indexes isn't that next piece, right? That's not to say we won't have them someday. Um, I think I'm getting thrown out because I think that these people are coming for the next talk. So thank you very much. Um, <laughs>